I'm Mark Seifter, and this is Arcane Mark. Today we're talking about how an RPG book is made. Specifically, how one is made at Paizo. Because, honestly, there are probably a lot of different processes that every different RPG company uses. When we talk about books, there are different terms that might come up during the conversation. And whenever I notice a term that you might not recognize... I'll try to define it. One that I'm going to define now that might come up later is spread. A spread is two pages of the book that when the book is open, you will see both of them open at the same time. Like my hands here in front of me, those two pages, if this was a book, would be a spread. And those are very important because the types of things that you display on a spread are things that you want to go together and that you don't want to break up and force you to turn the page in order to see something else. So that is what a spread is in case I mention a spread. So there are a ton of different steps in making a book. By my count of the number of steps that I put down here, there's almost 30 steps. I want to give a disclaimer before we go any further, however. I am a designer. I am a member of the design team the steps that I do in this process are the design steps. Therefore, I could easily have missed other steps that are very important in making the book that are not part of the design step. This is purely a reconstruction that is based on my knowledge of what goes on during the process and is not meant to exclude or minimize any contributions that are made during the process that I may have missed in this list and I am happy for anyone to correct me and add more steps to the process. But before we go too deeply into what all the steps are, I thought it would also be useful for us to discuss who is performing these steps. The people performing the steps in this process are the what we call the editorial team or the creative team at Paizo. Now, there's a lot of other really, really important staff members at Paizo who are not on the creative team. And there's also one step um, near the end of the process, a couple of steps, really, that are going to be from off of the creative team at Paizo. All right. Now, once again, uh, Paizo doesn't have sort of an official team structure for the company. But I'm a game designer and also before that in computer science, so I like building data structures. So I have attempted to build the best representation of Paizo that I can with my limited ability to draw little stick figures and things in Word. Again, I may have missed something up um, or messed up what the organization is. This is not the be-all and end-all. And furthermore, it is not the entire creative team. It, it has sort of abstracted away the Starfinder team because we're going to talk about a Pathfinder RPG process. And if we were doing Starfinder, we would have the Starfinder team in the foreground. So all those caveats being said, I'm going to switch you over to the organization chart while I keep talking. All right, here is the chart. It might be a little hard to read if you're not in full screen mode because, well, there's a lot of sub branches of the chart. It starts at the top of the creative team with Eric Mona, the publisher and chief creative officer at Paizo. Now, Eric is not at the top of the entire company. This is only the branch of the company that is the creative team that we're looking at today. There are many other branches. There's the tech team, the operations team, and so on. But this, uh, these are the people who really directly make your books. So we see Eric there is at the top. Um, and underneath, we have several different departments, each of which have a department manager. So we have Jason Bowman. The, he's the director of game design. He manages the designers. Adam Daigle manages the developers for Pathfinder. Amanda manages the Starfinder team. Judy manages the editors. And Sarah manages the art team. Now, People all have different titles that we're not going to go into here. We're only looking at the structure. There's also several other people who are not part of any of those individual teams. So, of course, James Jacobs, who is the Pathfinder creative director, and Mark Moreland, the franchise manager. They're sort of like a mini 
team of two that do a lot of world content stuff. We'll talk about some of the steps that they would perform on any given book, but they do a whole lot that is not even going to be in a book. Like Mark Moreland is going to look at all sorts of products that are not our books that maybe our partners are creating to make sure that the franchise is matching the vision. And James, as the creative director, is going to make sure that everything is matching his vision. And off there on the side is Gabe. He's our project manager, which means he's in charge of basically keeping the sometimes chaotic and always crazily over full of schedules by the running smoothly as possible and getting products out, which he does great work at. Thank you, Gabe. I'm going to thank you here on this stream because in reality, people rarely thank project managers enough since... The time when the project managers talk to someone is usually when your project is behind schedule. All right. So down in here, we can see um, several different teams that you can take a look at. So for the designers, there's Stephen Logan and me. See, it's me. I'm over there near the sort of curving angular one. In development, there are the org play developers for Pathfinder. John Compton, Linda's Eyes Palmer, and Mike Sayer. Uh, Thurston Hellman is also an org play developer, but he's with the Starfinder team. And originally when I was going to try to put in the Starfinder team for this and I found that it had too many people, I tried to put the org play over on the right and sort of include Thirsty in there. He is part of the org play developers. And of course, there are non-developers that are crucially important to the org play team, such as Tanya. The, who manages the entire organized play campaign and volunteers. Um, you'll see that John and also Sonia's name over in art are bold. Bold title means that they have some sort of a lead or directorial role that is also in their title. And I wanted to make sure to include that. So other developers for Pathfinder, you can see Eleanor, Luis, Ron, and Patrick are not org play developers. Eleanor and Luis have been often working on the world guides lately, and we're gonna probably use a world guide as an example of a product during this stream. So they might come up as example developers. And then Ron and Patrick have been doing more work on adventure paths lately. And so that's what they've all been up to. Then we've got a whole bunch of editors down there under Judy on the diagram, we've got Adrian, Lacey, James Case, not to be confused with James Jacobs. We've got Leo, Jason Tondro. There are a lot of Jasons. If I had done the Starfinder team, there's a third Jason there. So really, we just need a Pathfinder developer and an artist who are Jasons to be maximally confusing. And of course, Liz uh, for editing. And then for art, we have Sonia. You'll notice she's bold again. Emily, Adam. Not to be confused with Adam Daigle up in development. And then Tony. Alright, so that is the diagram of people. I'm going to switch it back off of that onto me. And we're going to talk about some of the steps at this point. So, first though, are there any questions about that diagram that I just showed you? Which again, might be very inaccurate. But I like building data structures. And it's the best structure that I could come up with. It actually is not the structure that we started with when I started at Paizo. We started with a actually much more inefficient data structure that had a what I like to call and what computer scientists like to call a higher recursion depth. The tree was had more steps in the branches because basically everything except art and design was also under um, under an extra position where the editor-in-chief was over the editors and the developers, but there was also an editing manager that was above the editors, and the editors were in an extra level of recursion depth, and they've since moved up the tree uh, to the top in a way that is more balanced and more efficient, which is really good. So that's about it for the organization. Let's move on to the steps. And again, we're going to be using all of these, um, all these people that I showed you for throughout the book because it starts as you might expect with an idea for a book now where does that idea come from it could come from a lot of different ways it could come from a brainstorm where a lot of people come up with ideas for a book 
someone says, yeah, that's a really good idea. There's a vote. Could come from a high up person in the company just coming in with a brilliant idea and being like, this is what we're doing. And then we do that book. Uh, but basically, you have to have an idea before you can even begin anything else for the book. And that could be anybody. So the next step after you have the idea for the book is the ISBN product code assignment. That's basically where you wind up getting, you, if you've looked on the back of your books, there's like a PZO something something number back there, which everyone at Paizo finds critically important. And based on the trivia contest results, the one time John asked about that almost nobody else really ever looks at. But it is very important to get the products their codes. That actually happens really soon, before you really know almost anything about the product. All right, and there's a question here. I wonder what the system was with those. Basically, the numbers that come after that, like the first number often is uh, going to tell you what product line it's in, or at least product lines at some point started with the first one or two numbers, and then the low numbers at the end tell you the order within that product. But it's not always consistent. Even so, it's a very important step. So next, after you have that code, is brainstorm sessions. Now these can be as official or unofficial as you like. Mostly, the longer the book, the more likely that the brainstorm sessions are going to be large and include a lot of people at the company. Particularly, if there's a lot of stakeholders, and certainly now that we've been switching over an edition and switching over in the process, there it is much more likely that some of the early books had a lot of people at the brainstorm sessions. For example, World Guy 1 and the book we're calling for now World Guy 2, the other one that comes after it in that line, had a large number of people that were at the brainstorm, both people who were near the bottom of that tree and also a lot of people near the top of the tree were on that book at the brainstorm session. There's a few people, however, that you're always going to need for a product based on our new system that we're using starting for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. I will note that the process I'm discussing here is not exactly the process we used in Pathfinder 1st Edition. Generally, this process is more inclusive and makes sure that there is a diverse group of faces and voices from all the different teams who can take care of a product. It's very possible some of these steps before would have been skipped or would have been done by a smaller number of people. And indeed, in some products, particularly the PDF only Pathfinder Society and Starfinder Society products, some of these steps, steps are gonna be skipped regardless. So anyway, in our new process, we now have a design lead, a development lead, or as you'll soon find out for some of the world guide leads, and an edit lead. And these three or four when there's two development lead people are going to often be brainstorming and working together and taking back any questions to their teams, to the, their branches of the tree, when something comes up that requires more eyes. So in a typical brainstorm session for a smaller product, you might see that that's mostly done by those leads. For a bigger product and particularly for the early world guides, tons of people were in there and a lot of very high up all the way up to the big name at the top of the branch um, throughout those brainstorming sessions. So once the brainstorming is complete, the next thing to do is to write an outline. You have to write an outline and figure out how many words things you think are going to take, roughly what pages you're going to set everything to. And part of that is you want certain sections, like I said before, to be in spread so people don't have to flip the page to get to the other part of the same section. So you start out by writing that outline and that is gonna be typically done by either a designer or a developer, depending on whether the book is sort of primary rules or primary lore. But it can also change just based on who's available, who is gonna be the primary uh, outline author. And the outline will be based on the brainstorming session and they could wind up being as simple as sort of a very brief idea of where to assign the words to as complex as including a 60-page a master's thesis worth of material 
that was provided by a, a very enthusiastic Paizo staff member who is really into the topic. Although that latter one is pretty rare. Did happen, but pretty rare. All right, so once you've got that outline started and you've, you've come up with something, you have to get the outline approved. Typically, an outline approval, especially one that's very lore heavy, is where we're gonna go into that smaller side branch with James and uh, James Jacobs and Mark Moreland, so they can take a look at any lore implications of the outline. But you'll also see outline approvals go past a variety of different people. If it's about an area of Golarian that someone is very passionate about, then you'll probably see them take a look at the outline as well. Once the outline is fully approved, then it's time to assign the writers. Now, Paizo does almost all of its writing, except for some design work that I'm going to discuss in a moment, uh, through freelancers. That means that Paizo gets the raw original text from someone else, and that someone else might be Paizo. Paizo often hires its own freelancer, uh, its own staff as freelancers in other projects. Like you'll see the names of your favorite Paizo staffers on um, your adventure paths, on your world guides, on your rules content everywhere. Because well, Paizo staffers were hired at Paizo. They know how to make quality Paizo product, and it's easier to handle their tax than just about anybody else. But there's also a ton of talented freelancers who are outside of Paizo who help contribute really great stuff to, um, to the line. And in fact, it's the use of so many freelancers that really allows Paizo to include a lot of diverse voices and to stay fresh after really a long time of Pathfinder 1st Edition, if you think about it. At about the same time as you assign writers, is when you would begin any in-house design. That's something that really has to be done in-house or just should be done in-house because it's easier than assigning it to a freelancer. For example, any class work is always done in-house. You're not gonna send, tell a freelancer to write a new class. Classes are very special and are kind of different than even any other rules design. That's because of the fact that a class is not just a rule. It's the player character's identity. And as much as player characters identify with their character, it's their identity. If you get something wrong in a class, people are going to be a lot more upset than if you get something wrong in a monster. Because the class that they play, the character that they play, is their avatar. It is them. So we always do classes in-house. And there are certain other things that we tend to do in-house in as well. Um, there's a question, what about prestige classes? Um, thinking about Paths of the Righteous. So prestige classes and archetypes are not always done in-house. However, they are by far some of the most complicated things to handle during some of the later steps. They are um, very challenging to design, but a task that we put up to some of our top freelancers and I've often gotten some very good results from it. But Certainly, they have been the most likely things to get something absolutely cool or absolutely full of pitfalls. And it's very exciting when you're going to see what comes back for archetypes and prestige classes. All right. So, we've assigned to our writers. We've begun our in-house design. But what do we have to do next? Well, once the writers give you the thumbs up and say that they're in and for how much... Got to remember to submit the contracts. The contracts go through finance, which is another team that we're not even looking at here. But the, the person who submits it is typically going to be either a developer on the project or in the case of a project that was outlined by the design team, it's usually Steven. Uh, he often deals with the contracts and the freelancers when the design team are taking point on the outline. All right, so great. We submitted the contracts. Freelancers are, are busily writing, in-house designers are designing if it's one of those books. What do we still have to do? Well, now is when we're going to send the cover brief to the art team. Now, the cover brief is basically a description of 
sort of the mad fantasies of the design and developers as to what we think should be on the cover. And that's true for any art brief that we write. It'll have descriptions, it will have any reference arts that are necessary. And when those are sent over to the art team, whoever is handling the cover and for, for a lot of the hard covers where it's Wayne, that's usually Sarah, who's all the way at the top of the diagram, if you remember, for the art team. But whoever is handling the cover is going to do the art order. That's where they take the art brief and actually order the art from the artist. So great. We've got a cool cover art. It's going to be on its way. And our things from the freelancers are on their way. The next step only can happen when we get something back. So the next step is we receive turnovers from the freelancers at that point also we're going to have to make a final pagination based on what actually happened or at least what we think is going to actually happen sometimes what we receive from the freelancers isn't exactly what we expected especially for an adventure sometimes things are going to be ordered a little bit differently and particularly in an adventure you don't know exactly where the maps are going to fall until you have it ready in something like the world guide, a world, uh, the, the Lost Omens world guide, for example, a lot of the pagination was pretty well known. It was going to be about the regions with an introduction and some s stuff at the end. Like, we kind of knew that ahead of time. For books that are done with design, it's usually very, very close, but sometimes it's changed a lot after that point. Path Under Unchanged changed a large amount from between the outline order and the final book, it all really depends on the product. Once you have the final pagination in hand, that allows you to realize where and when you need to place art and what kinds of art. Because until you know what the final pagination is, you don't know that. Now for some of the larger books, particularly the some of the rules heavy books and some of the books that I was saying that you kind of knew ahead of time what the final pagination would be, you might have to do this before you get the text in from the freelancers. It's usually better to do it as much after you have text from the freelancers as you can. And it's pretty much impossible to do the art briefs for the entire book with uh, for an adventure without actually having the adventure in. Because you don't know what NPCs and you don't have the maps. And the maps are an important part of the art order. So... You get together the art and map briefs. It's just like the cover brief, except it's way more. And you have to think very hard about which characters you're using or possibly overusing, what your mix is. Try to get a lot of the different iconics in there. If you can, figure out who's best for each scene, where you should use a half-page piece versus a full-body piece, and send over those briefs to the art team. And... At about the same time as you're coming up with these briefs, you start the design and development passes. These are passes by the design lead or possibly multiple designers if there's a lot of rules. And the development lead, um, possibly multiple developers if there's a ton of lore content. And these passes are one of the main steps where a lot of revision and cohesion are put into the process at Paizo. And the reason why these happen at roughly the same time is while you're doing the development and design is when you might be able to figure out more about the briefs. Now again, for those big RPG line books, you probably actually had to do the art briefs ahead of time just to get them in because it's such a large art order. For an adventure, it's much more similar to this where you go through and look at what's going on in the adventure look at the maps, decide what you're doing with those, and as you're doing that, you make the art order to the art team. All right, so you've sent over the art briefs, and now the art team is going to do that art order. Again, this is whoever is going to be in charge of art on that project. It's, it's often for the projects I've been on, Sarah or Sonia, but it could be anyone on the art team who deals with a particular type of project. So, you have gotten the art order. The next thing that happens after that development and design pass is done is we send it over to the editing team. So, let's talk about World Guide 1. On World Guide 1, um, let's go back 
for a little moment to our organizational chart. See it here? All right. So in World Guide 1, down over there under Jason, you have Mark Seifter. That's me, uh, the design lead. And you see Eleanor and Luis there under Adam, the development lead. So we pass it over to the edit lead, who happened to be Judy. Now, that's not because she's at the top. She just happened to be the edit lead. Second role guide, Lacey is the edit lead. And so on. So it could be anyone. You, you hand it through the edit lead over to the entire editing team. And the editing team is going to, the editors are going to split it up and start editing. They like to do as many different passes as possible because the more people who look at something, the more likely you are to catch a mistake. So this is going to be what's called the editing pre-layout phase. This is done before the files are laid out, which we'll see is going to be one of the steps soon. And during this part of the process, the, the editors do some of their first passes. They look for anything big in particular because of the fact that if it was going to affect layout, that's going to be a big problem. And then they start coming up with editor questions to send back to the developers and the designers to figure out, I see something weird. Is this, is this wrong? Is this meant to be this way? The editors are mostly looking for ways that uh, the rules and the text and the English language in them express are expressed. Basically, is this easy to understand? Is it grammatical? And how is the language used? And this is very important because what I have often seen, like with advanced class guide people would say oh no the the editing in the original advanced class guide was was off and look at this thing and then they would talk about a something that was definitely us designers fault that was a rules error not to say there were not also editing errors in the first printing of the advanced class guide but it's not the if there's a rules error and the rules are not doing something good that's usually something for the designers. So to step back for a moment, the art team is definitely dealing with the art and the layout. The editors deal with the use of language. The designers are going to deal with the rules. And anytime we're creating a new game, they're going to, um, or we, are going to be dealing with the framework, trying to step back, look at the big picture of how things fit together. Kind of like if it's Legos, the designers are the ones who figure out about Legos and who often design sort of the way Lego pieces are made. Developers are a lot like directors and producers of movies. And so developers are similar to people who make the sets with Legos that are really cool and put together the Legos into something really interesting. So that's why I said earlier that the design and development passes can happen in tandem. Uh, as, for instance, with World Guide, um, World Guide 1 maybe didn't happen quite as intended as we would like because the rules for the game were also still being written at exactly the same time. But in theory, we could hand over the rules sections to me, since I was the design lead, to take a look at, and hand over at all the world sections with the development leads, Eleanor and Luis, and then we can pass it back to double check ourselves because... There could be rules implication in the lore, and plus, uh, everyone at Paizo more or less is is at least somewhat invested in the lore. And similarly, the developers are very invested in the rules, and so they might have other opinions about the rules or where the rules and the lore interact. All right. Anyway, off track for a moment, but I wanted to talk about designers, developers, and editors since in the teaser on social media I did say I would explain what those three are. We're back in editing. So we're doing some editing in the pre-layout pass. At some point, and I will tell you exactly which point this is, it is the point that the art actually has come in. Enough art that we can credibly lay it out. Which, um, whenever that happens, it is time for a layout. Now the cover hopefully might have come in earlier than that, but it doesn't really affect the layout super a lot. So once the art is in, layout begins and that's when you go from files that are just text with sort of all the styles in them into InDesign, Adobe InDesign which is a program that has stories and is used for 
basically doing design work on books. So the art team, someone on the art team, again, for the books that I've worked on, usually going to be Sarah or Sonia. Uh, for other lines, it's someone else. Uh, they're going to lay out the text that you gave them using a style conversion that converts the styles from the documents that you had into styles in InDesign and put in the art in the places where you said that the art goes, or at least roughly there in a place that looks aesthetically appealing. Once everything is laid out, well, that's when you find out how much you were wrong. Because we would try to estimate how much space a piece of art, a sidebar, any kind of layout element is going to take and guess how many words that we need to include in a particular section. But guess what? This is never right, right? I mean, we do the best we can. That is when you do something that is called copy fit. So copy fit is kind of painstaking process. It's a little bit of a puzzle as well. In copy fit, you find out how much each section is over on words or under on words how many lines over and under usually and then you have to figure out some way to either add more lines or get those lines back that can be a mixture of adding and subtracting text changing different features of the text possibly just changing the wording to be a little bit different than the way that the wording is changing something that's called tracking which is what decides where the lines end on any particular given line and sometimes even if you use a very standard tracking like zero means that you didn't do any weird tracking the line can look really weird because if you just tracked it in a little bit you would get another word up there and it wouldn't have just this giant gap because well it was tracked at zero and you if it was tracked at negative one it could say uh, pathfinders sometimes appear or something like that instead of Pathfinders sometime and then a huge gap between Pathfinders and sometimes where you can almost but not quite fit the word appear. So you have to figure out what tracking looks good. This is also the point in time when um, I'm, I'm going to tell you beforehand just RPG authors and developers and designers are not evil but this is the point in time when we kill widows and orphans which are either lines that are sort of by themselves at the top of a page that belong with the paragraph on the previous page or words that are the same situation where they're on a line by themselves and they belong with the previous line and they can look aesthetically unappealing to some readers there's also some other things that we sometimes do during the copy fitting process due to the fact that Paizo used to be a magazine company and in a magazine space is premium because some spaces ads and the other spaces text people will not like it if any column doesn't fully fill up most bookmakers don't usually care about that but at Paizo we typically do fill all the columns due to a legacy of having done magazines before and sometimes that makes it even trickier because a way that you could fix the widows or orphans or help copy fit might work better if you left a line at the end of each columns but we I believe we've moved away from being as strict on that um, with the new edition in Pathfinder first edition it had to go to the bottom of every column no question even if you had to subtract an important line or add a line that actually made it less clear um, but now uh, we're gonna be a little bit more flexible on that and hey copy fit is sometimes tedious but some people at the company um, sometimes find it fun I know that Ron who's one of the developers on that list has said that he finds copy fit very fun and I think that Ron is always welcome to do my copy fitting if he likes so when the copy fit is done it moves back to the art team for copy fit approval this is where the art team glances over the copy fit makes sure everything still looks good Sometimes when you do copy fitting in a particular order, you'll m miss up that that uncopy fit something somewhere else or that some of the changes in tracking wind up not looking as good in a certain way. And the art team also might move or change the size of piece of art that could happen in a mixed copy fit as well. 
is particularly if the designer or developer it just gives up and says please save us art team there's a variety of things they can do such as moving a picture that was sort of in a column into the space in between two columns where it takes a little bit off of both sides but doesn't eat up the entire column or if you need to not if you if it's the opposite and you don't need more space back you need to use more space taking it out of the middle putting it into a column is typically going to help with space a lot all right so that being said once you're done with copy fit being approved where does it go editing post layout back to the editors because you can never have too much editing or at least I've never seen too many products that we put out that had too much editing so you put out some editing post layout that's where the editors not only continue the process of iteratively editing but also check to make sure copy fit didn't mess up something because of changes that were required to get the book to fit and you do as many passes of editing post layout as you can as well during this phase usually once the editors if you think of the of the editing team as like you send in the developers and the designers who by the way I didn't mention this that's who's copy fitting it's the people who originally sent the text in because they're usually the most aware of what can be done and what should be done to the text and are able to add completely new rules or facts about the world or things like that if necessary but so once you have sort of sent enough words to the editors that the editors have more than enough to do with the main book that's typically when uh, the designers and developers are going to work on the table of contents the credits the legal text and the back matter the glossary index the OGL and, and any ads as well as the back cover text it's called back cover copy because copy is the term that's for text like body text is called body copy it's just a way that it is kind of like spreads it's another term I probably should have defined out of the beginning but I didn't so you, that's the point where you work on those things because you now know who worked on this book you're now pretty sure about where things are on the table of contents because during copy fit that pagination you made before it's probably still exactly the same but sometimes it can't be sometimes you have to change the pagination again from the so-called final pagination especially if you find out in one of the bigger RPG books this was more common it's like well this section is under by two pages this other section is over by two pages if we just change the pagination then we have no problem so that might change um, but that's the point in time where you can figure out about all the front matter and the back matter matter once you have that done there's another step editing the front matter the back matter and the back cover because everything needs to be edited and especially those kind of front and back matter that have to refer to things and where they are editing could have changed where things were and so there needs to be a final editing check on those all right so we've even edited the front matter, the back matter, and the back cover. Are we done? Not yet. At this point, we're going to, art, to set it back to art to create an approval PDF. An approval PDF is a file that is available for people to page through. At that point, it immediately moves to pre-approval read-throughs, which sometimes don't happen. And I'll point out some of these steps that we've gone along the way just don't always happen. For example, a Pathfinder Society or Starfinder Society scenario is PDF only and is short enough that you can't just say, oh yeah, I sent the editors 100 pages of other stuff, now I'll do the front matter and the back matter. And it's not that long. So they do the front matter and the back matter while copy fitting instead of while the editors are doing the main text. It all depends on the size. All right, so pre-approval read-throughs are when there is somebody who really, really needs to read everything that is in this book who was not part of the process of all the way dialed in all the time for example in world Guide one uh, example of the people who you would want to have pre-approval read throughs eric mona mark morland james jacobs all those people and eric all does a lot of these pre-approval read throughs you can often find him sort of 
like with a, a clipboard and uh, part of the book like wandering the halls as he walks along and, and makes these really detailed notes where he finds a bunch of stuff that just nobody else found. But uh, Mark Moreland and James are more likely to be in something like a world guide. Now, these are only pre-approval just because they need even more time. And honestly, sometimes Eric is reading them even during the editing step and is considered to be an editing pass. Eventually, it moves to the final approval. At this point, they print out the PDF and put it into a conference room where a bunch of stakeholders go into the conference room and page through looking for usually a few specific things, but really anything they can find that is off, and leaving post-it notes in the printouts that indicate exactly what the last things that need to change are. Because once that's done, it's uploaded to the printer. If you need to change something after that, even if it's a plus 79 perception check on a monitor lizard, uh, has anyone heard about the plus 79 perception check on the monitor lizard thing? That was a thing. Um, all right, so that's going to cost a lot of money. Basically, any page that needs to be changed will now cost a lot of money because after it's uploaded to the printer, you get back the printer proof. That's where the printer sends it back. It's like, well, here's what we've got, and we're going to print out this what you want. And at the printer proof stage, you can make changes, but every page is going to cost like more than multiple copies of the entire book to have a change. So you better be sure. And Jason was very sure he did not want monitor lizards to have plus 79. So they don't. And that happened during the approved printer proof stage. All right. So we've approved the printer proof. This was our last chance to change anything. Are we done? Well, we're done with anyone who was on that diagram that we've talked about before. But there's still a little bit more that has to be done in the content management, which is part of the tech team and the web team. So at this point, the web ready PDF and final product image are selected. You may have noticed on Paizo.com that there is usually an image that is mocked up that just sort of similar ish to the um, product, but is not actually the final image. And at some point the final image goes up with uh, a description. So that is something that is prepared at that stage. Before those actually fully go up, there's a quality approval pass to make sure that everything is good with that final PDF. And then it's uploaded along with the text. So it's usually text that was already written um, for solicitations, which could happen really any time when they need particular solicitations in the process, depending on where and when it was written. It was, it was done well before that, so I suppose I should have put a solicitation text in earlier but it, it just depends and often getting out a solicitation early can help get the information out to distributors and other places but sometimes when you want to sort of have a, a secret that you can announce at a certain time it pays to have solicitations later or change what you're doing with the solicitations once you have uploaded the final pdf and the printers are printing their stuff then at that point everything's good so we've said what all the stages are, but what does that mean in terms of when things happen? When do any of these stages happen? Well, the idea for the book and the, the uh, could be a very long time. You don't really know, but the idea could have been well before you started working on the book. But those brainstorm sessions and the outline writing often happens like as much as 10 months in advance of the book. You assign the writers, you have to give them some time. So often when you start seeing previews or start seeing us discuss or even first reveal a book, um, but especially when we start discussing a book that's coming out in, say, three months, well, um, and people online will say, oh, well, you should add X or Y or Z. Usually we're past a stage in the process where, well, we've already got to the editing, the layout, it's pretty late. That's if they're lucky and it's uh, it's early, then it might be in the point where we theoretically could change it if we made huge amounts of changes to something else. Sometimes it's already been sent to the printer before, before that happens because 
the printer needs a certain amount of time to print out everything. And uh, I'm now blanking on exactly what day uh, Pathfinder Core Rulebook for second edition went out, but you guys probably saw uh, people announcing that, yay, it's out on social media. It was quite a number of months before the actual book comes out. It takes a while to print books. So all of this has to be done a while before the final ship date of the book and when the book gets to you guys. There is a gap, basically, after all of these things are set, are said and done of... Well, let's see. We've done we've done the final approval. We sent it out to the printer, and there's a gap of usually at least three months at that point before uh, the final books start coming back, and we can see these beautiful, beautiful books that we've been working on together. All right. So there's a question here. The web product info update. The time when hit Control R on this tab that's been open for months finally leaves my morning routine. Uh, I would say that's probably pretty fair, especially if there's a product that you're really looking forward to, then you can always check out to see if that has happened. All right, so that is basically all of the steps in the process that I can remember, recall, or piece together. I'm sure I've missed some really important things that just happened not to come in front of my eyes as a designer, and I'm sorry for that, but... Does anyone have any questions about the process here, about what any of the people in the diagram um, for the creative team, what they do, uh, how Paizo works? Hopefully, uh, this has been somewhat informative. So that way, when you see people online who are like, the devs don't know how to write games, then you know that they were saying they were blaming the wrong people because, again, it was our fault uh, for whatever they didn't like. Um, let's see. Any other questions for you guys? Because certainly the process is not always exactly the same as you might expect. All right, so the question is, what are the biggest process changes in the addition change? Sounds like things were shaken up a lot. Well, what I just told you is how the process works in the addition change. Uh, that's a good point about the way it worked before was roughly similar to this, but essentially it was much more enclave, by which I mean usually there would not be as much collaboration between the different teams, so it would just be someone goes off and does a whole bunch of these steps, um, and it was sometimes very piecemeal, especially when we did had not hired... Uh, if you look at the list of people again on the tree, let me put it up. So if you look in the developers here, it's worth noting that while I circled the um, the org play team over there for being the org play team, but if you're not counting John and Linda on the org play team, everyone else who is on there was actually hired relatively recently and before we had them the process was such that there really weren't enough developers overall i mean you can see that's a lot of people that were not there uh there were other people there at the time things moved around but what that meant was that not only were things a little bit more of an enclave but also that you couldn't guarantee that you had the same person available at a later step who you had in an earlier step which was not as good for the process. So, for example, you're always going to have one person do the full stuff that they need to do. So, if they're developing it, they develop it. But they might not have been the same person who outlined the book. Um, now, this is not the case for the uh, sort of the rules line, the RPG line, because those were more enclavey in that they were a design pass and only a design pass, which rarely got a development pass. So those, uh, because of the fact that the design team, the books are giant and it's the same design team, they had a lot of sort of stability in that sense, but also lacked uh, more input from the development team that will be able to help. And also it's fair to say that the core rulebook and the bestiary for um, the second edition were more of a 
design team did a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of iterations in that in-house design step for years um, before we had some development passes and other things happening. So you can definitely have different changes in those passes, but basically the main change is to be interconnected. Having a design lead, an edit lead, and a development lead who can interface and who are known to be the go-to person on that team for that project is new for uh, the second edition process. Up until that point, like the design team was gonna design their things. Um, there would be someone from the development team who had to handle everything other than editing and art for the uh, one of the other books. And then the whole editing team went in as they could for each book, but without one particular person who had been following the process along the entire time for that book and was sort of the expert on that book, what that book needed, had been talking with everybody else and really was more, more informed in that way. So it's really a lot of being able to be interconnected and have all of the different divisions work together and talk to each other a lot more, uh, creating sort of little chat channels that are about each of the different books. We could talk about things such as where we are in the process working together to help with hiccups where everybody works together or just fun things like Tsukumogami that we like can be something that we talk about in the product or like, you know, a link to some final boss music when we're right at the end. So all sorts of things like that are sort of new elements to the process. And that was a very good question because I did say I was going to do the compare and contrast. And I did it a little bit, but I didn't was not as explicit as I probably should have been. All right. Does anybody else have any questions about the process? I'm going to leave um, a little bit of time for that. All right. Any interesting pinch points or idiosyncrasies in the production process you were surprised to learn? That's the question there. I think I just really didn't understand when things happened. In time wise, I think that a lot of fans, and I was included, thought that the book, when I learned about the book, that must have been, there must have still been some time on the book. Uh, I think that that's something that I really didn't expect. Other than that, I'm not sure there's anything in particular that super surprised me about the books, although. It's definitely true that uh, we've been changing all the time as we went along. For instance, we've been able to have more design and development passes on books even before we went to the new system, just because people thought, hey, let's do some iterations. And I was in particular someone who really, really wanted to do more design passes on every rule because I feel that every designer, myself included, has a specialty, something that we look for in that roles that we will see that no one else will see and things that we will miss that other people wouldn't miss. So having more iteration is definitely really cool. Um, I wouldn't say that's an idiosyncrasy, I suppose. So as we're getting towards the end, um, there are a few things I want to do with the Twitch audience in particular. So if there aren't any more questions from you guys, or if there are, I'm happy to answer them. If not, I'll say bye to YouTube and then we're